Okay. Uh, I think we stop at the resampling method. So the last section is about a resampling approach to how we use it to, uh, for p values and also FDR. So resampling approach is one of the approach that when we do not assume the distributions where the theoretical, we say the theoretical null distribution is unknown. And then how they actually do it is they're using this Benjamini Hotchkirk approach. So, oh, sorry, not the Benjamini Hotchkirk approach. So they're using a different approach. So suppose that your now is where you're assuming your estimated expected means are about the same versus they are not the same. And you have an independent observations from X and certain independent observations from Y, let's say. So the T statistics is still quite similar where there's a difference of mean and divided by the standard deviations. So what we are expecting is we want to have obtained a large T where this will provide us evidence against the null hypothesis. So uh, using that resampling approach, they have these algorithm algorithms that um, we can use to test, resample the p-values. So you will have usually will have a very large number of samples, then you permute it, the n means the n the observations from the x and the y at random. Then you compute the t-value and then you will have a p-value using the formula. So the resampling is where you will have, you make a stronger assumptions where the distribution of X and Y are the same if the null hypothesis holds. So when you swap the observations from the X and the observations from Y, then our T statistics will be computed based on this sort data. And if they have the same distributions, then your null will hold. And if they do not have, the same distribution, then the null does not hold. So um, using this data set, the Khan data sets is where you have uh, about 2,308 genes in four subtypes of different kind of cell tumors. So when you're doing the, let's say you have two subtypes, um, I think these are the two tumor types where there's 29 observations in X and we assume the observation in Y is about 25. Then we have a resampling now distribution and we actually obtain a T statistics of let's say negative 2.09. If you use a theoretical now distributions means you have about 52 because how you get this 52 is you need to add the observation from X and Y and then minus two. And based on that T52, we have a theoretical p-value, which is about 0 0.041. So if you go back to the algorithms, you do a resampling of 10,000 using this method, you first find, so what we found is like T25, then after that, we have a, let's say, B, we set it resampling to like 10,000. And then you do a permutation of the observations. Then you compute um, the data. You compute the value on the permuted. So this 13.11 is the previous one. Uh, where is it? Huh? I think you have to refer to the textbook. It's not here. This is 13.10. So 13.11 is this one, sorry, is here. So here, this is the T value. So you compute the T, then you get the results. So what happens here is we apply the algorithms and with 10,000 and we obtain a P value of 0 0.042. The theoretical null distributions based on this observations from X and Y is about 0 0.041. So the theoretical is 0 0.041, then here is 0 0.042, so it's larger than. 
Then the, the other one is where you said, just look at the specific genes, which is they look specifically into the gene 877 genes. So what they found is using that the theoretical p-value is about 0 0.571 and the resampling one is 0 0.673. So it's still larger, the resampling p-value. So what to note is in the setting is sometimes when you have a smaller sample size or when you have a more skewed data um, distribution, the theoretical now distribution is usually less accurate. Okay, so you will see a more pronounced differences between the theoretical p-values and the resampling p-values. So this one, you can see the distributions for the first one is quite, I think it's quite normal for both. So that's why the theoretical and the resampling p-value is about the same. Here, this one is slightly different. But then I think because they only look into the specific genes instead of all the genes, that's why their differences is a bit larger. Okay. And oh no, they actually there's actually an explanation here. So because there's a single observation, so because they are collecting the observations from the 877 gene but there's a single observations that are very different from the rest of the observations. So it's a, this is a more skewed distribution compared to the first one. Okay, so uh, for false discovery, we are using the benjamin hodgkin procedure. Then, so last week we talked about how false discovery rate is slightly better compared to the other uh, multiple testing approach like uh, Bonferroni and Holmes or even Turkey and Shafi. So one thing is like false discovery rate is very useful as in let's say you have a very large sample and you just want to downsize your samples into a smaller a smaller subset then we it's more applicable to use a false discovery rate especially when your multiple testing is more than like 100 or it leans towards like 1,000 or 10,000 times. So, so if you want to control for false discovery rate and when you do not have a theoretical null distribution, what we can do is first steps, you can do apply the benjamin hodgkin procedures and you do estimate your false discovery rate using the resampling method. So you do not have to compute the p-values. So, False discovery rate from last week, we know that it's just a ratio of how many false positive towards all the number of positives. So we will have, let's say our test statistics is we will have a something called a C values, right? So you will have select a threshold of this C and this is really dependent on the researcher. So you want to have how many false positive. So you set that C based on how many false positive you want. And you do not want this false positive to exceed the C value. So C is actually a threshold. So to do that, they say you first select the threshold. Then you will have a multiple testing. Then you have to compute the T, let's say it's a T. T statistics, you will have to compute all the T based on the data. Then for B sections, because you have to estimate using via the resampling method. So B, you have to set it to how many times that you do want to resampling and you do the exactly what you did earlier for resampling method, which is permute, then you compute the T value. Okay, so you can see when we were like, this is one of the figure where they look into the two types of tumors. So we have actually two curves. One is the orange dotted one, and there's actually a blue line as well. So the orange line is used, is looking into the FDR, means the false discovery rate using the benjamin hodgkin procedure. Whereas the blue one is the false discovery rate using the resampling approach. So there's actually 
not much difference. Okay, so conclusion is when the resampling approach is useful is you only use resampling method. I think most of the time, if you cannot get a theoretical null distributions, so you or you need a more stringent assumptions. So that's all for the resampling one. Then for the lab, you have something. Um, so the lab, I don't really have much, but because the book was just talking, I was looking at this one, but uh, the book has this, I think someone else from cohort two actually posted all the libraries and the data set. So for multiple t-tests, they just mentioned that if they use row tests, it's just to calculate the row, this one, isn't it? Then they also have this null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. So this is the null hypothesis. I think this is where they're trying to generate a vector. Then for the gene expressions, they look into the dimension. They have 873, 8,793. 8, and these are all the genes and the numbers. So I want to talk more on, because this is a chapter on multiple testing. So I want to talk more on the family-wise error rate. So to calculate the family-wise error rate, we have that formula, which is one minus one minus K to the power of M. M is the number of testings that you actually have. So there are two ways to control for the family-wise error rate that we talked about but, uh, last week. One is the bond ferroni method and what the other one is the uh, bond ferroni holmes method. Okay, so the only one way is when you're calculating the T, uh, T values and if you do want to con correct for the uh, multiple testing using the bond ferroni approach, you have to use something called p dot adjust. They have it. They in this um, book club, what they did was they compute it manually. But there's actually one functions in the base R where you can just use p dot adjust, and you specifically specify in it. You just specify bond ferroni. So that will be the faster way instead of doing the manual calculation here. Because I think for Ben for Rene, what they did was they set, uh, they figure out K. Okay, remember, like if you set your alpha to 0 0.05 and depends, M is the number of testing that you have. So you just need to divide that and the K value, then you compare all your P to this threshold, this K threshold. Okay, so this is the way that if you look at here, this is the way they show you the steps by steps. But you obviously can do it the faster way using the p.adjust. Then, oh, this is the one that I talk about, the um, p.adjust. So the other one is the false discovery rate. You can... To control for that, you just need to remember you need to specify the value of the false discovery rate yourself. So it really depends on whether you want to set it to 0.05 or 0.1 or 0.2. So you can use this method and you just specify method FDR. The same is for bond parody as well as Holmes. I think Holmes, the initial is BH capitalized. Then the other one they talk about, you can use a Q value from this Q value package. So I haven't used this before, but it's, it seems that the codes here are quite easy to follow. You just need to specify the values. Then anything less than 0 0.05 means 95%. Then you calculate the mean. Then you calculate the proportion. 
And then next one is, um, there's a trade-off between, last week we also talked about there's a trade-off between type one and type two, right? So we, what you want to consider is how much you want to control for type one error and how much power that you do want to have because power is the probability of you not making type two error. So they, they are related, type one and type two error. So when you control more for type one, you have less power. Then if you are less stringent with type one, you have more power as well. So this is the one, the table from the book. And this is all the false positive and false negative and true, true, true results. Okay, so um, I think this is Federica's idea. So this is, I think this is the code that why she wanted to look into. She was doing a replications of a fake data. So this is a replications of the data. And I think she used 1000 replications for the, to test for the false discovery rate. So obviously here you have N and M. M is the number of data sets. Um, I'm not sure about the quotes. I haven't looked into it. So, seems one for Ronnie here is use look at she's using 0 0.05 divided by m. How many testing? Which is 8,793 testing. That's 8,793 multi now hypothesis. So, 0 0.05 divided by m. Then on the other method she's using is this FDR, which stands for false discovery. Then she look into how many of these now is actually less than whatever you calculated here, which is Q Wow's one. Then this one, I think she's using Q value, but all these should generate about the same results. Uh, maybe not. Born for a new will have less significant one. Okay, uh, then the Benjamini Hodgepet method is if you refer back, the Benjamini Hodgepet method, right, is what we use for you need to rearrange your p values. So, one way the algorithms is you need to first specify the q, means what level you want to control for FDR. Then you need to rearrange all your p values in ascending order. So you arrange, let's say, all the, let's say, from the fund manager, what they did was they rearranged it from the smallest to the largest p value. Then they calculate the L. The L comes from the specified the level 0 0.05 times the position. So if you the smallest p-value is times one over five, and you want to check whether the p-value is lesser than this algorithm, uh, this calculated p-value. Okay, so what they found is they only managed to, only these two will be this significant, the first two, then the rest are not significant. Then, okay. Ah, uh, so you should we review the t test? You want to review the t test? So this one is they set it to. They create a ten times one hundred, so about one thousand. So you have about one thousand observations. So because there are one hundred variables and ten observations, and with the mean of, this is 10 and this is 100, the vector. It seems that the first 500 has a mean of 0 
and variance of one, and the rest, the other 500 variables will have a mean of zero and the variance of one. And they calculated the t-test using t.test function, obviously. And what they found is the mean of x is 0 0.605. And they calculated the p-values for all. And the decision is this one. Using the functions for i in 1 to 100. So the decisions is when the now is false, let's go with, sorry, let's go with the now is true first. When the now is true, you do not want to reject the now, which is 47. Mm -hmm. Then when the now is false, you do want to reject, which is 10. So means here there's a wrong decisions about 40, and there's also a wrong decision about three here. It seems that, okay, when the now is true, you reject three, I think three out of 50 is about nice. But the problem is with here. When the now is false, you do not reject that. So it means you fail to reject that. And the percentage is quite high, 40 out of 50. So about 80%. Okay, then what they did was this one, they were like repeating the key test. Mm, but now it seems that, you know, so the X matrix, they are repeating it. And it seems that it has changed. As in what they did was, One point. Okay, so they repeat it with plus one. So the other one, when they have variance of earlier, this was the first one was when you have a mean of 0 0.5. This one is, I think, mean of zero and variance of one. And when mean is zero, there shouldn't be much difference between the two distribution. So when now is true, they did not reject. And when the now is false, they mostly reject. That's why you see here, it's about nine. When now is false, they do not reject nine. So the number has dropped here. Okay. Uh, we mostly talk about the fund manager. So this one is looking at the first five managers when we assume their mean of return for each of them will be about zero and they run a t-test mu is zero then you will see these are all their p-values one dot p-values here is the first one is 0 0.006 so if you just base it without correcting for the multiple testing, you just base it 0 0.05. You should be able to reject the now for the first manager and the third manager. Okay. But if you use the bond Ferroni method, you should only be able to reject the now for the first manager because um, you use the p.adjust and the method when you specify to bond for only, you should be able to reject just the first one. Okay, because remember it was 0 0.05. If you run five times, your new threshold now is 0 0.01. So we should only be able to reject the first one. Using the Holmes method is less conservative compared to Bonferroni, and I think that's the more preferred method. Using this, Holmes method is where you rearrange your p-values, then you reject based on their position, actually. So you should be able to reject the first one and the third manager. And then, if you look specifically the mean into all these five managers, right? What we realized that it seems that manager one and manager three 
is they are performing quite similarly, whereas two, four, and manager five, they are performing quite poorly. So what we can do is we can run a t-test of using a turkey's method. So turkey's method has, has a different way of calculating. So turkey's method is you comparing, actually comparing, I think is manager one and you comparing manager three. And manager one and manager three are performing quite similar. So what you can do is you compare manager one and two. So this method, when you're using turkey's means you actually have looked into the mean. So you have a predetermined kind of like idea of how you know like there's a difference between manager one and two. So you actually comes in with a predetermined hypothesis. Uh, um, one thing I can add here, I used the uh, Turkey's method in my research when I was doing grad uh -huh. school. It's exactly the other another example could be when you have a treatment and you're expecting mm -hmm. some sort of like effect or interaction between two specific conditions um turkey mm -hmm. method gives a better results like when i say better it's a more precise comparison compared to like bonferroni or uh homes the homes method is it it has kind like of like bon a bias Ferroni and homes is I'm not sure. Like one for any homes is like it feels like you don't have a predetermined kind of like hypothesis, yeah. you just test everything. Yeah, exactly. And one for only is more like a hammer. You hit everything mm. with that hammer. Yeah, it's like and I feel it's very stringent. It has a very stringent criteria. Whereas I think I use homes more or the keys more. I think these two methods are the more preferred one like i'm not sure is there a difference between because some people say turkey and the other one is turkey hsd i wonder whether there's a subtle difference between these two methods oh i don't know uh, i was I using know, I've, seen, I've seen like yeah i've seen turkey there's sometimes sometimes people just mention like turkey hsd Okay, uh, and the other one, have you used the Chaffe method before? <laughs> I think Chaffe is where, just now remember that manager one and manager three, where you actually have looked into the mean. So you want to do more of a group comparisons where you can group manager one and three as a group. Then maybe you compare manager one and three versus manager two, four, and five. So that is a Chaffee method. Then the next one is we use the uh, Benjamini Hodgebert method, BH. So it's still quite similar. You just use the same functions, p dot adjust. And this one is still quite similar. I find it very similar to the Holmes procedure where you still need to rearrange your p value. But I think this one, we specify the Q, which is Q uh, is the FDR value. So, um, why is it? So it's still the sort here. So this one is the figure that we previously have it in here. So they say when you have multiple null hypotheses, in this case, they have about 2000. You're applying a different um, alpha level at 0 0.05 versus 0 0.1 and 0 0.3. So this one is really small, the alpha. And what you can see that there's a difference between applying Bonferroni and Benjamini Hodgepet procedure, the BH procedure. So the green line here is actually the Bonferroni because the threshold always remains the same. Whereas for Benjamin Hodgebert method, the threshold actually is this orange line and it actually changes, especially when you have more M. 
So what happens is if you look at it, the alpha you set is to very stringent, like say 0 0.05, right? You almost don't, um, for both method, whether Bonferroni or Benjamin Hodgman, you almost did not reject any of the null hypothesis. But when you set it to 0 0.1, Okay, when you control your Q, means we set our force discovery rate, the Q, to 0 0.1. Then um, uh, Bonferrini actually do not reject anything, but the benjamini hodgkin method actually uh, can re reject it about here, the blue line dots here. So they say they actually reject 100 over, which is 146 rejected in the center. Whereas if you set even higher, obviously we will reject. And even though we set our alpha, let's say the Q to 0 0.3, right? So you allow 0 0.3, 30% false discovery rate. For bond ferrum method, you will see that you only managed to reject one. But then for uh, using the BH method, you reject almost quite a number. So that's the difference using like the force discovery. So it's good that we can, uh, you have multiple testing, especially for those like genetic studies where they have like many genes that they need to test at the same time. So it's good that you use like the force discovery to like streamline your options. Then before that you run a further more detailed analysis later on to really determine the gene that really makes a significance. Then the final, final one is the resampling approach, which is the one that you have to do the permutation one. I have no idea like what uh, Federica is like trying to do the quotes here, but I guess you all can look at it. So for resampling method is you do not have a theoretical null distributions. So you need to compute uh, a T statistics and you want to do it multiple times. So you keep on resampling it. So one way is like using the four function, using the functions to keep on resampling it. So after they use this, so this is based on the fake data. So they use this to resampling it and they obtain a p-value of 0 0.0416. And because this is a stimulated data set, so we kind of know what is the theoretical null distribution. And what we risk out is oh, we have a quite similar p-value based on the resampling method. So if you, the final one that when we talk about is when using resampling method, if you do not have much difference in the distributions, your theoretical p-value and your resampling p-values that you get, the value should be about the same, unless you have very extreme observations where you have a skew distributions, then your theoretical p-value means the one which we always do not know, versus our resampling p-method, p-value will be very different. And that's the formula for the codes for the t-value test statistics. And actually, I, have not, I think here is she, what she was doing is like she's still resorted. I think sorting it from the smallest to the largest, you need to sort it as well. And this is the number of rejections. So the number of rejections for resampling method, right? So one way is you think of it like using the benjamini hodgeberg method or the resampling method. Here is like it seems that the performance are quite the same whether you're using the resampling method or the benjamini hodgeberg procedure, it seems that they get about the same results. So actually when it's like really useful is we use resampling approach most of the time when you don't have a distribution, I think. But 
I also think like the Benjamini Hodgeberg approach seems to be more accessible and easier to use. So it really depends. So I think that's all. It's not a lot. Oh, when do you join therapy? <laughs> yeah. It's not a lot, but that's the lab one. Ah, uh, and I managed to publish it, so I have to post with the GitHub. I don't know my GitHub page. I tried to work on it, but the GitHub page, right? It didn't work. So I publish it somewhere else. Like, do you have any questions, anyone else? No, I'm good. I don't have any questions. Thank you. I think that's that's all for our book club. So if you guys are interested to join another book club, please do join. <laughs> or if you want to coordinate another... I'm not sure whether they are starting a new cohort for this uh, book because... It seems that a lot of people actually are interested to join the book club, then eventually people drop out <laughs> throughout the week. So if you guys are interested in coordinating the book club, please do let John know. Then I think I will join the other book club without coordinating it. <laughs> and I've posted the link all in the chat. Yeah. yeah. So... I guess that's it. Then I hope to see you guys around the Slack. <laughs> so this will be our last session. So that's it. And see you guys around. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for coordinating this. It's been great. And I've been missing the past few once in a while. So sorry for that, but it was great. That's why I think you can join the cohort four. I think they are just about uh, where you drop chapter off. Three I or think. four, yeah. yeah. No, That's I think they are in somewhere point. chapter seven, I remember, because oh. they were asking for, was it or chapter eight? Because they were oh, asking for I Jeremy's see. slide. Right, 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 yeah. I remember they were like asking about Jeremy's slide, where to get the link. I remember. Yeah, so... If you miss out those like chapters, you can follow the cohort form. Not sure if the timing works for you because it's on the no. weekend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably no. Yeah, like most probably don't work on the weekend. <laughs> yeah. All right. So see you guys around. Bye. Thank you. See you around. Bye. Bye.